There will be spoilers ahead. Dread, originally named Dread 3D during that weird time period in cinema where everyone felt the need to do 3D for some reason, is one of my favorite movies ever made. So I am very much excited to be talking about this one today. In Dread, we follow Judge Dread, one of the judges who fight crime in Mega City 1. Each judge enforces the law by acting as judge, jury, and executioner. Dread is tasked with determining whether or not a rookie named Anderson will become a judge. During her assessment, Anderson and Dredd respond to a triple homicide at Peachtrees, a megablock that belongs to the merciless gang leader known as Mama. After apprehending an important member of the Mama clan, Mama locks down the megablock, so no one gets in or out until the judges are dead. Dredd is pure over-the-top action, on-point dry humor, and smirk-inducing one-liners. Even though this is just like a pure action film, Dredd still manages to be up there with some of my favorite favorite sci-fi classics. And I'm talking about the really like deep existential like pretentious classics. And the reasoning for that is that Dread is much smarter than it appears on the surface. The man to blame for this depth is the screenwriter of the film, Alex Garland. You may know this sci-fi superstar from having written uh, Never Let Me Go, 28 Days Later, and Sunshine, as well as directing Annihilation and Ex Machina. And he's writing the new Halo movie? What the- So I wanted to start this video by addressing the slow-mo manufacturing business in the room. Did Alex Garland actually direct Dread. To start, Alex Garland's script is the main reason Carl Urban was even interested in joining the project in the first place. In an interview from August 2012 with Hey You Guys, Carl Urban, this champion right here who plays Judge Dread, was asked about what it was like to work with Pete Travis, the credited director of Dread, and what kind of future he saw Pete Travis having in directing. And here's what Carl Urban had to say when answering those questions. He will do what he does and um, you know for me it was probably one of the most uh, amazing collaborative experiences that I've ever had. To my mind the real creative energy behind this film is the writer Alex Garland. He was on set every day. Alex is largely responsible for, for the movie you see. In fact, Pete Travis was later removed from the post-production process after the producers disagreed with Travis's creative decisions during the editing of the film. Later on, in a 2018 interview with Joe Blow, Urban confirmed that a huge part of the success of Dread is in fact due to Alex Garland. And what a lot of people don't realize is that Alex Garland actually directed that movie. Carl Urban is such a freaking bro. As he went on to say in a lot of these interviews that Alex Garland really was the reason why Dread worked. And just judging by their filmography alone, Garland went on to direct some of the greatest sci-fi movies ever made. And Pete Travis went on to do some, uh, some other stuff. So now that we've established the real creative mind behind Dread, now we can get started. Alex Garland, along with this amazing cast and crew, really went out of their way to make an incredibly well-detailed and lived-in world that remains true to the comics. The effort that went into making this film is outstanding. Garland Garland worked closely with the original creator of the Dread comics, John Wagner. The goal was to get this on-screen Dread as close to the comic book character as they possibly could, like capturing his dry sense of humor and overall cold demeanor. And all those gorgeous, gorgeous one-liners. It's all a deep end. A judge's helmet has its practical uses, like protecting the judge's head during a motorcycle crash or stopping things like bullets. But for Judge Dredd, his helmet is more than just protection, it's his identity. Carl Urban was very much dedicated to his role as Dredd, as he was a fan of the comics since he was a teenager. So he was more than willing to do things like drive the Lawmaster motorcycle himself and not take off the helmet for the entire duration of the film. Unlike some other adaptations we know of. <laughs> <laughs> Not taking off the helmet is really staying true to the comics. The one time Dread did show his face in the comics, it was censored. Carl Urban has even confirmed that as long as he is playing Judge Dread, he will never take off the helmet. So it makes me happy to know that Urban got to keep the helmet after the production was over. Since we're already talking about the Dread comics, Dread is littered with Easter eggs, references, and rad hidden details. For example, in the Dread comics, there was a point where they weren't allowed to use too much explicit language. So instead of using really fun words like f or f or f
They would substitute those colorful words with the word Drock. Luckily for Dread 2012, the movie is rated R, meaning they could use as much explicit language as they want. So sadly, there was no need to use the word Drock. However, Drock still manages to make an appearance in the film. During the opening chase scene, you can see Drock on the jacket behind the driver's seat and the vehicle full of criminals. Peach Trees is covered in graffiti that references characters from the original comics, like Minty is the Law, appearing on the wall as Dredd is running from Mama's turrets, Minty being a judge in Mega City 1. Fatty's Rule is graffitied on the skateboard ramp, Fatty's being a derogatory nickname for heavily overweight people who were discriminated against for their size during a time of food shortages in Mega City 1. When looking at some of the floors of Peach Trees, you can see the word Chopper, referencing a Sky Surfer from the 2080 comics who was originally a graffiti artist. And over here, we have Kenny Who, a failed Scottish artist trying to get his work published in Mega City 1. It makes sense that the two artists they reference have their names written in graffiti, especially Chopper since he was an actual graffiti artist. At the beginning of the film, Control reports a triple homicide at Peach Trees. Over here, on the opposite side of the screen, we can see that Judge Hershey has been assigned to a riot in progress. Judge Hershey is one of the judges from the 1995 film Judge Dredd. Anytime we're looking at a criminal's profile, we can see the arresting judge right here. Each judge's name is is based on a judge from the original comics. Peach Trees is actually named after the restaurant where Alex Garland and John Wagner met in order to discuss the screenplay for the film. A lot of the surrounding megablocks are named after artists who worked on the Judge Dredd comics, like Henry Flint, Tom Frame, Alan Grant, Kevin O'Neill, although his name is accidentally spelled wrong, as there should be two L's instead of one. John Hicklinton, Cam Kennedy, John Wagner, Ellie DeVille, Carlos Esquera, and Pat Mills. Atlantic Tower was most likely named after the Judge Dredd novel Black Atlantic, or the fact that Mega City 1 is on the Atlantic coast. Rowdy Yates Block is the block where Judge Dredd used to live. Sternhammer Block is named after a bounty hunter from the comics, Wolf Sternhammer. And Rose Block is, um... Well, no one actually knows what Rose Block is named after. When Anderson and Dredd are in the classroom, you can see a map behind Anderson. On the map, South Africa is highlighted in red, as a lot of this movie was filmed in South Africa, specifically in places like Johannesburg and Cape Town. And speaking of stuff in the background, when Dredd and Anderson finally reach Mama, behind Mama you can see a judge's helmet with a chain hanging off of it. This is a nice little nod to the comics, where a judge's badge is connected to their uniform with a chain. Whew! Anyway, Dredd's helmet adds to his overall enigma. The helmet is as permanent to his look as Mama's scars are to hers. Dredd's helmet represents his dedication to the law. He doesn't remove it because Dredd is the embodiment of justice. Mama quit working in the S9 Pleasure District after getting sliced up, so she got revenge on the guy who did it and took over his business interests. Mama's scars are emblematic of the turning point where she gained back control. Throughout Dredd, we focus on this fight for control. Mama took over Peach trees and is expanding her empire with slow-mo. Dread, along with the Hall of Justice, is losing control of Mega City 1. Dread is the law, and his judgment is final. Mama maintains the same level of control, but just within her block. So it's no coincidence that when they're showing the rise of her empire, the Mama clan is represented with the color red, same as the primary color of the judges. And when Peach Trees goes under lockdown, the interior of the building is illuminated with pure red emergency lights. The first time we we see Dredd. He acts as judge, jury, and executioner for three criminals. The first time we see Mama, she decides if three criminals get to live or die, also acting as a judge. In Mama's sentence, the men are given slow-mo and tossed over the edge of the atrium. Pretty severe punishment for sure, but this is done to send a message and maintain control. And if you think that's bad, let's take a moment to talk about how the judges carry out the law, starting with the homeless guy at the entrance of Peach Trees, the one who will uh, debase himself for credits. Dredd and Anne Anderson threatened to send him to the isocubes. But it's not even loitering that's his crime. Even though this sign right here says no loitering, Anderson specifically says that vagrancy will get him three weeks in the isocubes. Instead of supplying support for the homeless, offering assistance or rehabilitation or something, they treat the homeless the same way they treat criminals. In a mega block where the unemployment rate is 96%, their solution to the homeless problem is to just have the homeless man go somewhere else or get thrown into 
to prison. With a ridiculous unemployment rate, it's made clear that most of the slow-mo workers or other criminals in peach trees didn't choose the life of crime. It's simply a byproduct of a system that failed them. Especially Mama. When analyzing Mama's criminal record, you can see that she was only 16 when she was arrested for her first offense in the S9 district. Judges can only respond to 6% of the calls per day. So it's implied that the judges ignore slums like peach trees, allowing for crime to run rampant and give enough time for gangs like Mama's to take over. Mega City One is a heavily surveyed state. They got all that good stuff, like facial recognition software, psychics taking away the privacy of citizens, as well as surveillance drones scanning the streets. We're looking at a well-funded and overly aggressive fight against crime. We learn through Dredd's interaction with this criminal that Dredd doesn't negotiate, but if he does, the criminal never ends up with a good deal. The severe punishment, or death sentence given by the judges, is what causes these criminals to fight back even harder, as they no longer have any choice but to survive. In Mama's case, her means of survival escalated to the point where she had to go to war. The chief judge looks at their mission as a war for the city, but the judge's aggressive tactics in the fight against crime have led to greater resistance. What incites Mama to take such drastic measures to keep Dredd and Anderson in the building is that Kay will talk in interrogation. Dredd even mentions that after only a couple of hours in interrogation, their methods will get Kay to talk, heavily implying that the interrogation methods they use are effective because they're incredibly inhumane and unethical. It's safe to say that Mama firing her turrets to kill Dredd is almost no different from the beginning where Dredd puts a civilian's life at risk in order to kill a criminal. Dredd even throws a guy off a ledge to send Mama a message, the same way Mama sent a message at the beginning. Dredd is unaware of these commonalities he shares with these criminals. He assumes that because he's on the right side of the law, he's immune to any wrongdoing. He doesn't question the system. In this war, the main casualties are innocent civilians and families, turning the city into a meat grinder, as death and crime become a normal part of daily life in Mega City 1. There's a job dedicated to scooping bodies off the floor, and as they're doing so, you can hear an announcement over the speakers explaining that the food court will reopen in 30 minutes. Drock, that's messed up. It's no question Peach Trees is a representation of Mega City 1. In Peach Trees, the roles are switched. Dread is the law on the outside, but now walks into a place with a new jurisdiction. Dread is treated like the criminals in the rest of Mega City 1, as he's now monitored and put in a life or death situation because of his occupation. After Peach Trees goes under lockdown, Anderson quickly pauses as she notices this wall graffiti with the phrase no muties, as in no mutants. Mutants are a byproduct of the nuclear wars that destroyed the old world. The radiation from this war causes deformities in those whose parents were exposed to the contaminated wasteland. In the comics, there is segregation between the normal people and the mutants. Normal parents can give birth to mutants, which is what happened in Anderson's case, as they are exposed to radiation from being too close to the wall. If a mutant is discovered by law enforcement, they will either be terminated or exiled from Mega City 1 and sent out into the cursed earth. However, psychics are exempt from the Mutant Segregation Act and are recruited by the justice system. The Hall of Justice recruits Anderson into the academy at a young age in order to use her for her psychic abilities, the same way the Mama Clan took the clan techie and used him for his tech abilities. Both become all-seeing eyes to help the controllers. So it's fitting that Anderson was the one to let the clan techie go, knowing that he had no choice but to work for Mama, the same way that she was indoctrinated into the academy, and the same way most of these criminals have have no choice in their occupation. The Hall of Justice recruits orphans and raises them to believe in the harsh justice system, conditioning them to mercilessly carry out the law. So it's no coincidence that the antithesis of the Hall of Justice goes by the name Mama, symbolic of a role that defines an upbringing. In the end, Dredd gives Mama the same slow-mo throw-off building punishment she gave those first three criminals. When Mama's face hits the ground, the blood splatters and expands outwards in the shape of an X, like the one on a judge's helmet. It, signifying that justice is served. I'm having to censor that image, aren't I? Yeah. Okay, anyway, you'd think this would be poetic justice, but it's more indicating that this is all going to happen again. Mama could be anyone who is raised in the Mega Block. She was just the first to take over. With a down economy paired with the unresponsive nature of the judges, another gang uprising in Peach Trees is inevitable. Somebody else is going to take the throne, and the cycle is going to repeat itself. I know I may have went on a rant about those uh, Easter eggs earlier, but there is still one very important detail that stands out 
out to me. The billboard Dread passes during the opening chase scene. The one with Joe Saturday from Chrono Cops that was part of the 2000 AD comics. Next to Joe Saturday's face is the name Joe Soap. Joe Soap is an old military term for someone who's unintelligent. In the book, Service Slang, a first selection by John Leslie Hunt and Alan George Pringle, it's said that Joe Soap is the dumb or not so intelligent members of the forces. The men who are overwilling, and therefore the usual stooges. Dread is the overwilling cop who has this irrational devotion to the law, essentially becoming the stooge, as he blindly follows these rules and enforces them without question, even though through our relative perspective, the law is unjust. From the very start, Dread looks at Anderson as incapable of being a judge, as her final academy score was 3 percentile points below a pass. Because of her special ability, the judges council chose to overlook her scores. But Dredd can't see past the scores, he only sees things in black and white. No gray. No gray. Before Anderson's assessment began, Dredd informed her that incorrect sentencing is an automatic fail, disobeying a direct order from your assessment officer is an automatic fail, and losing your primary weapon or having it taken from you is an automatic fail. Anderson ended up failing every single one of these things. The final judge Dredd fights is named Lex. Lex is Latin for the law. Lex points out that the system Dredd serves isn't fixing anything in Mega City 1. The Justice Department is failing. Mega City 1 remains a crime-ridden meat grinder, and the judges are just turning the handle. In this shootout, and in the rest of Peach Trees, Dredd comes face to face with the law, as he is given a taste of what it's like to be on the other side of the law. Everything that made Anderson unfit to be a judge is what made her a good judge. The overly optimistic rookie does end up making a difference. Dredd passes Anderson, a small but significant step in Dredd no longer blindly following the rules. He's beginning to understand that the system he serves is flawed. Judges are the only thing fighting for order in the chaos, which is why they need more judges like Anderson.